This week on Arizona Illustrated, looking into earworms, learning the art of aerial silks, making many bones one heart, and preserving Tucson's past from the vault. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. You've had one, everyone has. You're minding your own business when suddenly you realize you have a tune playing in your head and it won't go away. Why? Where does it come from? Why that song? Well, researchers at the University of Arizona are examining the phenomenon known as earworms. I kind of imagine one of those uh, bingo ball machines that the balls are rolling and then one gets stuck. Mornings, waking up for sure. Uh, driving, in the shower, doesn't everybody. That's like the songs popping into my, into my brain. It'll start and end with sort of the same key or musical note and my brain will just sort of loop that over and over and over again. But just the last thing I heard that triggers something in my brain and then I'm singing that for the day, so. Music has a very special quality for me and just about everybody that I talk to in terms of its meaningfulness, its emotional connection. When we find a particular piece of music stuck in the mind for a long period of time, that may say something about that human relationship to music. The way that, it's, that the song builds up to that section. Mm -hmm. We are taking an interdisciplinary approach to try and understand more about earworms why people get them and why they stay in people's heads for as long as they do. So what the expectation is could be any sort of a pattern. The individual patterns don't matter, but the relationships do. So I'm bringing the science, the hearing science to the project, trying to look at what neural structures might be involved in, in earworms. Having worked with this earworm phenomenon now for the past year has really even heightened my awareness of the lengths songwriters go to make this one specific part of the song attractive to us. So one of the great things about being involved in this project is that when everybody knows you're involved in this project, everybody tells you you're their earworms all the time. Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, that just would not go away. And no matter how many times I tried to listen to something else, as soon as I stopped listening, it would just come right back, so. Anywhere from an hour to, you know, uh, a, a couple hours later, or even sometimes shorter. I was hoping that if I could complete the song, it would sort of help scratch that itch, but it didn't. <laughs> We've created an online survey, and it asks them to share with us their experience of music, a certain amount of demographic information about who they are, what their musical background is, and then tell us what their earworms are. Then we're bringing them in, and we actually run them through a standardized music perception test, which isn't about music knowledge. It's about basically your auditory system's ability to pick up things like a change in rhythm. We're gathering a list of songs and song snippets that people report as earworms. These are songs or parts of songs that get stuck in people's heads. And so we hear just these three notes, and it's a very simple rhythm, dut, 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 but we hear it in two different settings within the measure. And we've asked you to participate because you've told us that you've had earworms. We've recruited people to participate in structured interviews where they actually describe to me what the earworm thing is for them. And usually the ones in the morning t tend to be either from older movies or older songs or little jingles. The melodic or harmonic or musical material that gets stuck mm -hmm. versus those people who say it's the words that get stuck. Right. Popular, country, classical, jazz, all of these different styles have elements that can become earworms depending on the person. And again. That's it. 
that the lyrics are the distillation of my emotion at that time. But if it's something that is really annoying, then I want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. They're companions, but they're elucidating whatever your emotional, my emotional reality is at that point, and they can be a source of, of guidance and insight, I believe. Given that our question all along has been why music, the interdisciplinary makeup of our team has been vital, some of the things I've learned have been just about the music itself. And then the long is... The long is up, uptown funk you up. That's, yeah, so that's a short, short long as well. And they'll say, here's the song that stuck in my head. And it's not the last one they heard. It's not the first one they heard. It wasn't the one they liked the most. And so you're left with this question, why that song? We've had people say that they're very involved in reading, studying, writing, working, creating something. As soon as that stops, and instead they drive their car or wash the dishes, there's music in their mind kind of taking up some of the extra space. It turns out that those people with the highest earworms, a uh, number of earworms at least reported, are really good in terms of their melody abilities and less so in their harmonic abilities. Each person has a unique perspective on this particular experience, which is the earworm. There's so much that's public about music and public about our lives, and these earworms and the stuff that's floating around in my brain, uh, it's really just for me. I could still carry it with me, even though I don't have an instrument to play. I just take it in my head, so that's fine. I think it's really enjoyable to sort of get at the heart of a song and really understand what makes it work and what makes it beautiful. Well, if earworms provide us with a window into what our brains are doing when we're processing music, then that would be a wonderful thing for me and hopefully others to learn about. Have you ever dreamed of running away with the circus? I have. Kids of all ages love the circus and the performers who seem to defy gravity with their acrobatics. You ever wonder how they learn to do that? Well, here's a look at a local group teaching circus arts to the next generation. If you want to do circus, then you should because you could find out that you could do things that you didn't know you could do. It's kind of like riding a bike. You just have to learn how to do it, and then you can do it. <laughs> My name is Katherine Tesh, and we're at the Rhythm Industries Performance Factory, where Tucson Circus Arts is located. I'm a performer with Bom Chen Pyrotechnic Theater. I do aerial, stilts, fire performance. We're practicing stilt walking and stilt dancing for a Klom Chen Pyrotechnic Theater. All the movements are from an African traditional piece called Soli. We have a few different stilt dances that are part of our repertoire. It's our own interpretation of movements that we put to more like club music. I am watching everybody do the dances and then looking for where things might be different or somebody doesn't know a piece of choreography and try and help them make sure we're all together and we know what we're doing. <laughs> Aerial silks are two pieces of fabric or one piece of fabric that's folded in half and you hang it from something and then you can climb and wrap yourself in different ways and do drops and tricks. It feels like really cool, like if you're a bat hanging upside down in a cave. My name is Lourdes, and I'm 10 years old, and I go to silk class. The best part is that the teacher helps me on doing the tricks, and then I get better at it each time I do it. Youth Aerial Silks. It's for any kid that wants to try Aerial Silks. We have some that are just beginning and some that have been doing it for a while. 
So they do warm ups, they do stretches, exercises on the silks to build muscles in their shoulders and their arms, and then they do technique on the silks, which is like tricks, <laughs> the splits, um, different locks off the ground, some drops, and then they have to do conditioning. So that's push ups, sit ups. My name is Nola, and I'm 10, and I do aerial silks or acrobatics. And it's hard, it is, but once you've done something or you accomplish something really cool, you have this like great feeling inside you, and you're like, wow, I actually did that. It's really, it's a nice feeling. I've definitely seen kids come in maybe just like slightly disinterested or they think, oh, this is just, I'm not going to be good at this. And then they find like something, maybe it's silks, but maybe there's other things, stilt walking or globe balancing or poi that they really like or that they actually do have like some innate talent at and then they connect with that and they want to keep working on it. Lourdes is particularly talented. She picks everything up really quickly and I think that when she first came she was really timid and now just because I think she picks things up really quickly it's made her feel good about herself and she feels more prepared to help other people and more outgoing. When we're waiting for our turn we usually talk or we help the other person that's still learning how to do something and then we get braver. I felt like I was like the weirdest girl in the world and that I didn't have anything special about me and it made me feel really bad. And then I stayed at Ronald McDonald's house, which was really fun. I had an operation, but I could still see, so I'm a survivor of cancer. It feels really amazing that I did that, and it feels like I'm the bravest girl in the world. <laughs> and I want them to get just a sense of confidence in themselves, and also just a sense of focus that they can use here and you know, other places. And also just, I mean, strength and exercise in general and just an appreciation for fitness. <laughs> I think that's very important too. I like silks because I'm up high and I feel like I can see a lot of things like I'm a bird. <laughs> kind of nervous the first time I tried silks but Catherine, she helped me. She just told me not to be afraid and just to do it, and she's gonna make sure I don't fall. I've just learned that I have a lot of inner strength that I didn't know that I had. Oh, my favorite part is dropping like all the way. <laughs> Going from the top and to the bottom in like less than five seconds in a drop. Nola's a really hard worker. <laughs> She'll do something over and over and over until she gets it right. Um, and also, I mean, she has innate talent as well, but she's definitely somebody that needs to get it right, so she'll work on it until she does. When you come down, you kind of have like that little fluttery like sensation in your body when you jump really high and then you fall. Um, and it's like that for me. It's just like, it's really exciting, but it's also like a little bit scary at the same time. Well, you just have to keep doing it until you've like conquered it and mastered it and then it's not very scary anymore. I think circus is really awesome because a lot of the kids come in and they see us do things and they're like, that is impossible. I'm never going to do that. And then when they do it, it's like, oh, if I work hard, I can do things that are impossible. So that's for me the most important thing. I'm not necessarily trying to make anybody a professional circus performer. If that's their goal, then I'm glad to help them. But I'd rather they learn that if they just work hard and focus, that they can achieve things that they think maybe are impossible. It kind of just happened, but now that it has, I just love it. I love working with the kids, and I also love performing. 
I mean, anybody can do this. You might start at a level where you feel like it's never going to happen, but if you stick with it, you know, kids, adults, all levels, all body types, whoever you are, if you try and you start and you keep working on it, you will, you can do it. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share videos from this episode. You'll also find stories from future programs, an easy way to submit your own story idea, an archive of past episodes of Arizona Illustrated, and you'll find everything you need to stay connected with public broadcasting in Southern Arizona, azpm.org. Tucson's All Souls procession has grown from a ceremonial performance piece in 1990 to an entire weekend of celebration and mourning of loved ones and ancestors. It culminates with over 150,000 participants forming this two mile long human powered procession. Local filmmaker Leslie Ann Epperson uncovers the artist's stories and passion behind this phenomenon in her film called Many Bones, One Heart. It's um, a story about people working really hard for something they believe in without money. I mean, it's not about the money. It's about creating culture from, from the community itself. What's difficult about making this film is I had to learn the software, I had to learn the hardware, and I had to raise funds, and I had to schedule cameras. I didn't know how to make a character-driven documentary. I'd always done essay-style docs for, for PBS, and so this was a new venture, so I read a lot, wrote a lot of grants. I started in 2010. We made a trailer. I spent a lot of time with Nadia Hagen and Paul Weir and getting to know them and um, interviewed some more people, interviewed Susan Johnson who founded the event. I started it because my father died. After his funeral and stuff, I just felt like I had a lot of unresolved issues and feelings and emotions to work through. I lived downtown on Broadway at the time. There were lots of artists in the area that hung out in the area. So I told them I want to do this performance piece. I know you don't know my dad, but just try to have some kind of connection maybe with something you lost or someone you lost. We did it for three nights in a row. We started on All Hallows Eve. And then we, we did a procession down the street on the actual Day of the Dead, on All Souls Day. It's two stories in a way. It's One is the story of Nadia and Paul and their journey to be independent artists and support this community thing and having it just blow up in front of them, become this huge thing that they, they just run after, kind of. Last year was 35,000 people marching and 30,000 watching. We've been kind of operating off a budget that had been pretty constant of about 40,000. Been pretty constant for the last few years, but then what happened last year was because we chose to use the Mercado as our ending site, our bills just went, they doubled. Yeah. Our barricading bill went up by three times. We had to hire a lot more officers. So our police bills also went up close to $10,000. Yeah, it's always the, fu the fundraising is generally the, the, the challenging part and sort of educating the public, because it's such a big event now, people just think, oh, well, the city does it for us. Because All Souls doesn't operate in the same paradigm that people are just used to, you know, having things 
operate, like even all the festivals and, and on all the events that people usually go to at different bars and stuff, those are all sponsored by huge corporate liquor corporations. Mm -hmm. Budweiser presents, like, part of it is education, is having people kind of understand what does it take to create your own culture. And I think it's important for everybody to share real stories with each other, and the All Souls Procession does that. It allows people to be real in, in a creative format, which is, again, that's a really human thing. And it isn't just Tucson. I think it's important everywhere to do these things. The most important part of, of me attending the procession was being able to remember my brother. And my cousin Brad also passed away. I carried a little sign with my brother and my cousin, and I was able to talk about them and show them off to the world because I am very proud of, of the two of them. I had never walked underneath 4th Avenue, where the train goes over, with about 50 drums banging on things. And it was all this life, death, birth, renewal, drum, drum, bang. And I remember smiling about as big as I had smiled in a long time. My mom passed away when I was nine. When my mother passed away, not only was I not allowed to grieve or celebrate, but I wasn't allowed to acknowledge her at all. Watching people honoring their loved ones, but also it being an um, expressive, artistic, celebratory experience, it's something that I can't miss. In 2008 uh, is when I became involved with All Souls Procession because I created our local AIDS memorial. It means a lot to me because um, that's why I created it, losing almost 85% of my friends here in Tucson. For them, I walk with the ribbon every year in All Souls, loving them, missing them, but also hoping for a cure someday. Despite the stress and despite the fact that they're independent artists who are already struggling to get by and they don't really need more headaches, they won't give up. They keep making it happen year after year, and that, that's been a big lesson to me, to not give up as well. And what I'm trying to do in this case, work on the film. You can see Many Bones, One Heart, Monday, November 2nd at 7 p.m. at the Loft Cinema with director Leslie Ann Epperson on hand for a post-film Q&A. At the base of A Mountain's eastern slope is a place where archaeologists have uncovered artifacts from a 4,000-year-old settlement, remains of a village that thrived 2,500 years ago, and evidence of the San Augustine Mission that was built for Spanish missionaries around 1800. But by the 1950s, time and scavengers had taken a toll. What was left was bulldozed to make room for a landfill. It's still not entirely clear what's going to happen at Tucson Origins Heritage Park, as it is now known. And the same was true in 1989, as we'll see from the vault. There are a variety of names that can be given to this place that is now known as the Convento site. The Tucson Village and Tucson Mission are two. It lies west of the Santa Cruz River and south of A Mountain between Congress and 22nd Street. It was here that the modern Tucson was founded, according to some archaeologists and historians, founded on a site inhabited for centuries. It's hard to imagine that people have been living here probably continuously for the last 3,000 years. And uh, there are burials, ruins of buildings, thousands and um, probably millions of artifacts dating to those time periods all around us. Now, what about actual physical evidence today? What we see mainly seem to be just uh, mounds of dirt. Well, right now, where we're standing has been turned into a dump, but buried beneath our feet, in fact, at this point, was where the colonial chapel was. And probably there are people, some, some of the first Tucsonans are actually buried right where we're standing. This is where the gente de raison, or non-Indian uh, burial ground, was at the mission. So there's a fantastic, just a wealth of uh, archaeological remains. They're not highly visible, and that's in part helped to save them. However, it is possible, just walking around this neighborhood, to see the foundations of walls that date back to at least the 18th century. These walls, constructed in 1875 as part of Solomon Warner's flour mill, are all of the structures that really remain standing in this area. And it is west of Grande Avenue. The Convento site is east of Grande. And there remain only very small fragments of the Presidio Wall. A road project in this area was put on permanent hold by the city council when the historical significance of the site became widely known. 
we got such a strong response back from the community in terms of preserving our heritage that we asked all those folks who have spoken out to come together as a group and try to do whatever we can to marshal community-based resources to make sure that site stays with us, that it becomes developed so that people can enjoy it rather than destroy it. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, a veteran you'll never forget. Stories from vets at Nam Jam, flags for the flagless, and train a dog, save a warrior. Honoring veterans on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara, see you next week.